Hey guys, Cajun Cardboard coming at you from the great state of Louisiana. Today we're looking at uh, the pillars of prospecting, part two out of three. If you recall in the first video, I'll let you guys know we're going to break this into three parts. The first part is factors to consider when you're NBA prospecting, identifying a prospect, identifying what cards to buy of that young NBA player. Um, those were factors to consider. Uh, I talked ad nauseum for 50 minutes about that. I'm going to try to keep this second video a little bit shorter. Today is those middle tier factors to consider with NBA prospecting and how to move forward with a young player in the NBA. Uh, we're going to call them important factors. These are not mandatory and these are not just little little tidbits, right? These are, these are important. They matter. Um, and they need to factor into your decision-making process, not one any more than the other. Uh, but again, these are factors that you need to consider when you're trying to identify a prospect to invest in. So um, here you go. We got the, uh, the thumbnail over here on the left. Uh, I want to real quick go through um, some of the, some of the, you know, just remind you of some of the criteria and I'm going to go real quick through these. This is just based on my five or six years experience buying cards, learning from being stupid, learning from, from getting things right. Uh, sometimes I'm right. Sometimes I'm wrong. I'm not perfect. Um, I just want to share my experience and what I've learned over these six years of doing this with you guys. If you're new to this, and even if you're not new to this, um, I, I feel like I would enjoy talking with other people about how they prospect and what they consider when they make those decisions. So the first thing is there's no one right way to do this. I'm not telling you it's my way or the highway or my way's best. I'm just giving you a whole bunch of a, a myriad of factors to consider. This video too, we're going to talk about some important ones. There's home runs and there's doubles. You can uh, swing for the fences and swing for franchise players. You can also find those low price point guys lurking in the shadows, the Anthony Simons, the Giannis's, um, you know, guy, the, the Siakams, guys like that, right? Who end up being franchise type players whose price point is baseline, super crazy basement low. The more boxes you check, the more likely you are to hit a home run. So the more factors that check off as in uh, positive for your prospect, the more likely you are to maximize your return. Um, this is an investing video. This is not for collectors. I am not telling you don't go buy Malachi Flynn. I'm not telling you don't go buy Maxi Kleber or Dorian Finney-Smith. If you collect a player and you enjoy collecting high-end cards of those players because you like those players, buy those players. This is a I want to make money prospecting video, okay? Um, again, that is not the bulk of what I do. I am primarily a collector, but this shit is fun. Prospecting is fun. Making money is fun. Uh, the past two weeks have been absolutely entertaining as I see my phone lighting up uh, with Anthony Simons and Darius Garland sales. That is fun to me. Um, I keep some of their cards. I sell most of their cards. The purpose of me investing in them was to make money so I could go put that money into Jordan and LeBron and, and Bird and Magic Rookies and some other cool stuff. And so that's just how I do things. I flip uh, you know, ultra modern prospect cards for profit and then I reinvest that money into you know set chases like PMG Reds and 86 Fleer and, and Jordan and LeBron and whatnot. Uh, we're not looking at particular traits. We're not looking at shooting, rebounding, ball handing, all that stuff. That's on you. You identify the prospect. I'm telling you uh, bigger, uh, big picture factors to consider. Um, this list is illustrative. It is not exhaustive. Okay, so these are things to consider. It's not everything to consider. Yes, I'm going to forget some things. Do me a favor. I want you to comment below and let me know what I did forget. And lastly, uh, if you've already invested in a prospect or two or four or 12, think about those guys and think about how these factors apply to them. Is it, a, is it, is it, are they, are they meeting the criteria? Are they, are they a plus in these factors or are these factors a concern for your prospect? Those are just certain things that, you know, that you guys can consider. Um, but, uh, I've got card ladder pulled up here and we're going to talk about a couple of different things in here. Um, and again, this is a, a video probably more suited for a podcast than it is for YouTube, but, uh, bear with me. So the screen may just sit here for a little bit, but really it's the words coming out of my mouth, uh, to quote, um, uh, uh, Chris Tucker and Rush Hour, can you hear the words coming out of my mouth? Uh, it's more about the words than it is about the pictures on these particular videos. Sorry for those of you who, uh, who are going to get bored staring at uh, the screen. Uh, so factor number one, team market size. No, that was video number one. Factor number one, positional plus size for guards and forwards. 
What I mean by positional plus size is, is your prospect uh, a plus size player for his position? Okay, and I know you guys are sitting out there and you're going to say there's tons of little people. Allen Iverson was tiny. Chris Paul, Trey, Ja, Kyrie. Yes, I get it. Again, remember, these factors are not mandatory. These are important factors. It helps for your player to be bigger than his average opponent in his position. It does help. Think about guys like KD. Think about guys like Harden. The success rate of your prospect becoming what you anticipate he will become and his card values going up based on performance, definitely it helps for that player to be larger than his average opponent on a night-to-night -night basis. It's easier on their body. They can take advantage of them in the post. They can guard their position better. They're more durable. All these things factor in. Kevin Durant, James Harden, Luka Doncic, Giannis, LeBron, LaMelo, 6'7 point guard, Tatum, bigger than the average two guard or wing, Jalen Brown, bigger than the average two guard or wing physically, um, Cade Cunningham, Anthony Edwards, just bigger and badder and stronger than the average person he's guarding or that is guarding him. Cade Cunningham even, big for a point guard. Those are examples of guys. Uh, of what I'm talking about, guys. So, historical examples for you old guys like me, we're talking about Magic, 6'9 point guard. Penny, 6'8 point guard. Uh, Grant Hill, 6'7 uh, sort of combo wing, two guard, but played the freaking point guard position, was going to be a top 20 player of all time before injuries derailed his career. Well, not derailed his career, but abbreviated his career as an NBA superstar. So ask yourself the question, is my prospect bigger than his average opponent as position? If he is, that's a plus. If he's not, it's not the end of the world. It can happen. I'm not telling you it can't. Ja, Trey, Kyrie, CP3, in today's modern NBA, it's it's probably less important than it would have been 10, 15 years ago when people could beat the shit out of each other. When defenders could literally just molest your player up and down the floor and put two hands on them. It matters less today, but it still matters. It's just a factor to consider. Uh, and an important one. Uh, buying the right parallel. Okay, so now we're starting to talk a little bit more about card specific stuff. Um, the days of buying base raw card, base raw prisms, getting them graded, getting 50 to 70 percent PSA 10s, and then flipping them is over. Okay, it's over for a few reasons. Number one, the pendulum has swung. Okay, those base cards are going in the toilet. Uh, I'll be the first one to admit it. I did this, I bought base in historically massive quantities. When I tell you, when I prospected, I would buy, I mean, I probably bought 250 plus Luca base prisms at 15 to $25 in that range, literally 250 plus. I graded them and I flipped them and I made a fortune. A lot of you watching the video did the exact same thing, but guys, those days are over, okay? The base prism buying, grading, and flipping is over for a couple reasons. Number one, base, the pendulum, like I said, has swung. Base is a bad word. It's a four-letter word in the hobby for whatever reason. I think the pendulum swung too far. I might do a video on this, um, uh, specifically diving into how much population there is on base and in, in kind of the distinction between 2021 base and like 2015 base prism. Those aren't the same things, and you can call them base and base, but they're not the same things. But uh, but in, another reason is PSA, you know, bulk value pricing at $8, $10, $12. It doesn't exist right now. Will it come back? I don't know. Nat seems to think it will. I think it'll probably come back around 20 to 25, but I don't think we're there yet. So that's kind of killed the buy base grade flip game as well. So you've got to adapt and evolve. I have. Uh, I know a lot of you guys have. Um, if you're new to the hobby and you're looking at buying prospects, Again, okay, so rarely do I give advice and tell you what not to do. I am telling you, do not go out there and buy a shitload of Chronicles base fill in the blank. Do not go out there and buy every base prism uh, John Morant you can or somebody like that. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I don't think that's a great idea. I think your money is better spent. Uh, rarely do I say don't do something. In this situation, I'm telling you, don't do something. I, I don't think now is a great time to do that. Uh, for, for 2018, 19, and 20, I'm not so sure that it's not a good idea to buy a bunch of 2012 base prism Lillards and Kawhis and Anthony Davis and those kind of guys. But again, that's not really prospecting because those guys are what they are. So that's a whole different, whole different one. So choosing the right parallel, huge important factor. I probably could have put this in mandatory factors, getting the right parallel. Your parallel needs to be available so you can get it and get it in quantity, but it, it doesn't need to be too available. In other words, it can't be too common. Like, 
you know, greens might be too common. Green prisms might be too common. Honestly, you need to ask yourself the question, is the print run for silver prisms and silver select and optic hollows? Is that print run now too high in the year 2020, 2021, 2022? Are those print runs too high? And, and a great example of that is Luca. Luca is having, again, people act like Luca's crashing and burning. I mean, what's his team's record? Like, he's got the Mavericks in fifth, and I personally think his teammates suck. I think Jalen Brown's probably the best teammate on his team. I mean, uh, Jalen Brunson, probably the best teammate on his team. But the Mavericks are 26 and 20. They've won 8 out of 10 at the time that I'm recording this video. Um, but look at what the Luka Doncic silver card has done over the last year, guys. This was a card that hit, believe it or not, gulp, $9,700. The last one on card ladder sold for 3100 Guys, this card is down 3X. You know, we always talk about going up 3X and going to the moon. This card is down 3X from its peak. And let's, I mean, even if we don't look at the 9000 let's go back to three months ago, okay? You know what Doncic is doing this season. I mean, Doncic's numbers this season are preposterous. And he's winning games, and he's hitting game winners, and he's waving at the crowd. And everything he's done his entire career, he's substantiating where he belongs in, in the historical you know, pantheon of the hobby. And his card, just since October, guys, this is three months ago, was 5,600. Look at his silver now, 3,161. It got even lower than that. It got below $3,000. And it's probably because of this number right there. It's real simple. Uh, there's 2,104. People are scared shitless. Uh, uh, because the base pop is a bazillion. Like, if you go look at his base, we've all talked about this. Where is it? Uh, help me, card ladder. Help me. Help me, card ladder. God, they got a lot in here. Okay. So, his base card is population 18,183. They have added 16,600. 1,500 base just since April. Okay. Um, so people are, are scared to death about base and the base population. And it's just really, honestly, I, I honestly think it's just carrying over. Um, I can't think it's carrying over to the silver. So something to keep in mind is silver might even be too populated. You might have to get into the numbered parallels with prism and select and optic, or even look beyond that and look at some, uh, low print run stuff and some other products. We're going to talk about products later because that's also an important factor. Um, but moving on, uh, there are too many parallels. Okay. And so that's a big concern with ultra modern investing. That's a, that's a concern with all three of these videos combined is, is there too much out there? Is there too many parallels? There's, there's so many barriers to entry, just understanding the parallels and how many there are. There's a lot of good videos out there. I'm not going to use this video for that, but I'm praying that fanatics comes in and stops this shit right now because there's just too many, too many parallels. They need to simplify it. I think back to 2012 Prism, base, silver, gold, green, four. That's it, period, end of story. And it's a beautiful, beautiful product. If you want to get to 10 parallels because you want variety, fantastic. But this 50, 60, 70, 80 different parallels in Prism, when you include Choice and Fast Break and Asia and, uh, you know, Dark Web and freaking, you know, Australian version, it's silly. It doesn't make any sense. There's just too many. Um, and I think that's just Panini chasing the dollar. So I'm praying that Josh Luber and Fanatics, when they come in, they, they seriously consider limiting the number of parallels in each product going forward, uh, whether it's Topps Chrome or Topps Finest or whatever they end up doing, you know, if they buy Panini and, and keep Prism going, whatever. Limit it, guys, please, for the love of God, limit it. So the right parallel is important. Uh, make sure you're buying a parallel that's available but not too available. Keep an eye on that pop rate. Um, it's also important, I think, to stick with the uh, parallels. And sorry, we're going to take a long time on this because it is important to identify the right card to invest in so that when it comes time to sell it, the hobby wants it. Um, and so I, I think it's crucial, guys, to, um, to keep in mind and kind of keep an eye on those parallels that have a history. Uh, red, blue, orange, obviously gold. Um, but when you start getting into like red choice numbered to 88, I don't know if red choice number to 88 will even be here next year. Uh, you know, elephant print, tiger print, zebra print, all that crap. I, I don't know if it's going to be here next year. None of us know that. So, um, you know, silver is going to be here. Silver is going to be here, whether it's in refractor form or hollow or silver. So just keep in mind the parallels you're buying. That's an important factor to consider. Okay. The next factor this is a huge one for me, and I personally only try to buy, I'm not saying you have to, but I only buy players who I think can be 
franchise players, face of the franchise players one day. If I don't think they can be the best player on their NBA team, I simply do not buy them, period. End of story, I do not. Now, I might be wrong. I'm not telling you every time I get it right. Um, but but the guys that, uh, that that are yes for franchise player potential, and some of these guys already are the franchise, obviously. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Doncic, Trey, Donovan Mitchell, Jalen, Tatum, Garland uh, isn't. Well, maybe he's becoming the face of his franchise, but Garland is the type. Cade Cunningham is the type. Can Jalen Green, can Kenton Porter Jr., can they be the best player on their team? I, th I think so. Um Cole Anthony could be. Suggs could be. I don't know. I don't know enough about those guys. Miles Bridges has the potential to be. LaMelo, obviously. Shea Gilgis Alexander has that potential. Michael Porter Jr. has that potential, even though, you know, he's a bad word in the hobby right now and his cards are in the toilet. Uh, not, a, not a bad buy, by the way, if you go look at how much those cards have dropped because of injury. Um, but it is what it is. Zion can be the face. Ja already is the face. Barrett can be the face. Um, Anthony Edwards can be the face of his franchise. LaMelo, we've already said. Uh, Tyrese Maxey, guys like that. These are guys that literally can be the face of their franchise one day. I'm not saying today. I'm not saying tomorrow. But they have the talent level to be the guy that the coach hands the ball to in the fourth quarter uh, of a playoff game, three straight possessions, and says, go get me a bucket or go create a bucket. Those are the types of guys that can do that. Here's a list of guys who some of you may invest in, and I'm not telling you you made a mistake. I'm not telling you you can't make money because you can definitely make money on these guys. But these are guys that would be what I would consider doubles. Guys that can you can buy low and sell higher, but you can't buy low and then sell when they become an NBA superstar franchise cornerstone. These are the types of guys, okay? This is, an, again, not an exhaustive list. Kevin Herter, uh, Precious Achua. Ayo Dosunmu, uh, Okongwu for Atlanta, Davion Mitchell, Desmond Bain, who a lot of people love, right? 3 and D, that's great. He's outperforming his expectations. That's great. But the dude ain't going to be the best player or the second best player on his NBA team if they're trying to win a title. Uh, Okoro, Ananobi, Denny Avdija, uh, Quickly, Cam Johnson, PJ Washington, Matisse Teibel, Brandon Clark, Michael Bridges, Sexton, Wendell Carter, Mo Bamba. These are guys that you can buy low and sell higher and make money. I'm not telling you you can't. But if you're trying to hit a home run, those aren't the dudes. Those are not the guys. I'm not saying you can't make money on them. I'm simply saying when I look for this, I am looking for guys with max potential that uh, I'd rather go one for three on home run swings than go two for three on Precious Achua and Dasunmu and uh, you know Desmond Bain uh, because there's more money to be made. Moving on, usage rate. This goes hand in hand with franchise player potential. Uh, the usage rate of a player is a humongous statistic. Um, and not necessarily their usage rate on day one when they step foot in the NBA. That is important and, and it's helpful, but I'm talking about their potential usage rate. Um, can a team, ask yourself, uh, when you're thinking of the prospect that you like, can or will a team ever run their entire offense through this player one day? Okay, not today, but can I buy them today? And then one day I see this team running everything, running the show through this particular player. That doesn't mean they have to be a point guard in modern NBA, okay? There are point forwards, there are centers that, that the offense is run through, and then obviously we know there's point guards that control the game and have the ball in their hands the whole game, like CP3 and Kyrie and Harden and all those guys. Um, think, uh, when I say look for guys that, that have the potential to be max usage rate guys, we talk about Kyrie, Harden, Darius Garland's doing it right now, Doncic on a whole nother level, LeBron, uh, or... Okay, category one was the point guards. Category two high usage rate is high usage wings. Beal, Booker, KD, uh, Donovan Mitchell. These are guys that can get you the bucket or create offense for their teammates. There are those rare point forwards, okay? Giannis, to a much lesser extent, Siakam, 
potentially a Scotty Barnes, okay? Guys that can do more than just play their position and defend their position. These are guys that can kind of dribble, create, score their own, and create for their teammates and make everybody around them better and, and have the ball on a, a large percentage of their team's possessions. And then in the very, 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 very rare case, there are centers that are high usage rate who offenses are still run through. This used to be commonplace in the uh, 80s and 90s. You guys remember Olajuwon, Ewing, Brad Doherty, Rick Smiths, uh, David Robinson, Shaq. What, way back when, you remember, the ball was always it was always inside out, right? The ball would go in and out, and the, the best example was Olajuwon. They throw it in, and then people just randomly stood there or moved around, and Olajuwon just played with instincts, and he was absolutely incredible, one of the most underrated players of all time. That's very rare today, guys, but there are two guys that come to mind, Jokic and Embiid. Can Aiton get there one day? Eh, maybe. I don't know. Um, he, Aiton's got some rim-running tendencies, but he's also shown the ability to step out to 18 feet and, and you know, destroy, uh, you know, other centers. Um, I, I'm not sure if he's there yet as a passer. Certainly, I don't see him ever being there, uh, being the type of ball handler that Jokic or Embiid are. Um, and I don't mean ball handler like blow by, but, you know, handling the ball to get where they want on the floor to create for others. So, so when you think about your prospect and you, you want to factor in usage rate, ask yourself these questions. Can my prospect ISO to get his own shot, right? And, and the answer with the guys on that first list that I mentioned up above, Herder, Achua, Desumi, eh, not really. Um, they're, they're not guys where you'd hand the ball to them. Can they run pick and roll ad nauseum over and over and over for 30 to 35 minutes a game with the ball in their hands and basically dictate the outcome of games? Can your guy do that? Is your prospect capable of doing that? Desmond Bain is not. He's a good player. He's not capable of doing what Luka Doncic does or what Donovan Mitchell does. He's a catch and shoot. He's a three and D. He's tough as nails. I love everything about guys like a Desmond Bain. I even like a Kevin Herter, and I like a, uh, a Cam Johnson. But Cam Johnson's not running 40 pick and rolls a game. He's not doing those types of things. So his usage rate's never going to be that number. And I think you've got to have the ball in your hands an awful lot to max your return on investments. Uh, can you envision your prospect getting the ball in game six of the playoffs, three straight possessions, and they clear the floor for him? I, I, those are the guys you're looking for. You want to get the next one of those guys that the hobby doesn't know about yet. So that's kind of my perspective. That's my swing for the fences. I keep going back to Anthony Simons, Kevin Porter Jr., because those are guys, and Garland, those are guys that I thought had a very low price point, very low, that can do those things. And it, it's turning out pretty well for me on those three guys in particular. Um, you know, knock on wood, God willing, they continue their progress, stay out of trouble and, and stay injury free and do their thing. Uh, moving on, off court trouble. We talked in uh, episode one about on court trouble. There's a lot of guys who are a pain in the ass on the court, bad body language, bitching at refs, bitching at teammates, not responding well to coaches and stuff like that. They can work through that kind of stuff. Right? There's a lot of guys that, that when they're young, they have those issues. I put off the court trouble uh, in, in a, the next tier of importance uh, here in important factors in video number two. Guys that I think about are um, Kyrie, uh, my guy Kevin Porter Jr. That's a huge concern. His off the court trouble is a huge concern, how he conducts himself off the court. Uh, Kobe, obviously, uh, as it turns out, was an off the court at least had one instance where off the court was a concern. Um, Dennis Rodman is a great example. Sean Kemp with all the shit he had going on. Thank God we didn't have social media back then. It would be X-rated. Uh, Barkley off the court was a problem. Um, so this is not a huge deal until it affects their availability. Okay, Humankind is extremely forgiving. They may be overly forgiving, too forgiving. Um, so in hindsight, we look back at Robin and say, oh, it's just Robin being Robin. Ah, oh, Kobe made one mistake. Ah, oh, Barkley threw a guy through a window. No big deal. That's great in hindsight, looking back years and sometimes decades. Uh, but if those types of activities, you know, take place off the court, like in Kevin Porter Jr.'s situation, the, one of the most talented young players in the league was told, we don't want you here by Cleveland. They didn't want him around. They literally, on a given day, said, enough's enough. We don't care enough about you. I don't care how good you are. Get away from our team. That's a concern. Um, it concerns me as a huge KPJ holder. Um, 
And, and I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, players, especially these young prospects, can mature and then get past that and then have a great long career. But it's more of a concern for active players because it could affect their playing time and their career path and their progression. If they're not on the court, they can't progress. I think about some guys um, where they're off the court trouble or, or the way they act, generally speaking, um, you know, affected their NBA career. Stephon Marbury is a great example. No matter what anybody says, and he still might be because the, the Hall of Fame is a world Hall of Fame. It's not just an NBA-specific Hall of Fame, you know, like Oscar Schmidt gets in the Hall of Fame and Sabonis and all that. Um, Stephon Marbury might still be a Hall of Famer, but he was a surefire Hall of Famer. The, that dude was unbelievably talented. And then he got blackballed by the NBA. He was just so weird and so... Um, unpredictable and, and just a loose cannon off the court and the way he acted and the way he treated his teammates and his in front offices and he just he he ran himself out of the league it was all his own doing and then of course he went to china and became an absolute legend they got statues and all that stuff but that's a great example of somebody blackballing themselves out of the league another example carmelo for a while there carmelo was persona non grata nobody wanted to touch carmelo obviously i'm not saying he's what he used to be but there's a purpose and a place for Carmelo Anthony in the NBA right now. I mean, he's he's having a very productive season uh, for the Lakers. So uh, off the court trouble is something to consider. Right or wrong, usually once their career over, their career is over, all is forgiven. It's just the way it is in the hobby, man. Um, all is forgiven. OJ Simpson rookie cards is a great example. Um, and I don't want to get too political or weigh in on OJ Simpson, but you get my point, right? How much more controversial can it be than OJ Simpson? And I don't mean to laugh about it because it's a serious topic. But uh, the hobby forgives people. Kobe's another example. The hobby forgives people for off-the-court trouble. It's only during their active career that it could be a concern because it could affect their availability. Draft position, lottery versus second rounder. This is a huge one, okay? Um, it's not impossible. So let's get, uh, oh, I get to use the screen here. So the picture in picture actually matters for a second. Um, the, the, the draft uh, position, where your prospect is drafted, uh, matters, okay? Again, this is not an all or nothing thing. I'm not saying you can't find a second rounder who's a stud, but I want to show you some statistics. I just did a little cursory dig in here. I went back all the way to the year 2015, okay? I am going to I'm going to say this. It's not impossible, but it is significantly more likely that your prospect will be uh will will yield fruit and max uh, your investment potential if he was drafted in the first round. And that likelihood increases even more if he was drafted in the lottery. Could your guy in the lottery be a flop? 100%. Kwame Brown, Markel Fultz, eh, the book's still open. Let's let him have his career. Ola Wakandi, Sam Bowie, injuries. Darko, Greg Oden, injuries. Those guys can flop miserably and be worthless, right? It can happen as a lottery pick, an early lottery pick. Uh, can you be a second rounder and thrive? John Stockton, Draymond Green, absolutely. There are exceptions to both to this rule. There's exceptions both ways, right? Um, this is this is why this is an important factor to consider, but not a mandatory factor. I'm not telling you don't ever invest in a in a in number 30 overall pick, and don't ever invest in a second rounder because I think there is possibilities out there for those second rounders. I am just saying if you want to hedge risk and increase the likelihood of identifying the the, the prospect that's going to make you the most money. You want to start at draft pick number one and work your way down. I am just saying, based on historical evidence, that's kind of the way. So I look through all the drafts, all the way back, and tell me if I'm missing something. Please comment below if I missed a franchise player in the second round. But I had to get all the way to um, uh, 2014 to find this guy uh, in the second round. Nikola Jokic, you may have heard of him, the NBA MVP. I did not see, and Spencer Dinwiddie is a good player. He's the, probably the next closest thing. I had to go all the way back, and I didn't count 2019, 20, or 21 because it's just too soon. But I went all the way back through all the second round stuff uh, to try to find franchise players that emerged as second round draft picks. And Jokic was the one. That's seven years worth of drafts, okay? That's 210 players drafted in the second round. And I came up with one of those players being a franchise player. Again, please correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I didn't I didn't spend hours and hours. I just flipped through NBA draft.net like you see on your screen. And I went from year to year to year to year. 
210 guys have been drafted in the second round in those seven years, and only one of them is a franchise player. So I don't like those odds. Uh, I'm not saying you can't make money on second round players. You can. You probably could have bought Spencer Dinwiddie for pennies and sold him for $2, and you can make money. Um, but if you're investing for four to six year long term holds and trying to hit a home run, I don't think the second round is where you should be looking. That's just my advice. Um, again, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm simply saying this is critical. This is a critical thought process where it's a factor to consider. Uh, the starting five horizon for your player. Okay, this is important. How how soon? This is a double edged sword too. I want you to understand. So the, I call it the starting five horizon. How soon can your prospect get into the starting five? Is he a is he a starting player on his NBA team day one, like Cade Cunningham or Jalen Green or Jalen Suggs? or John ja Morant, right? Um, that is a huge factor because that reduces their risk. But what does that do to their price point, guys? What happens to a player's, uh, I'm gonna, you know what, I'm gonna get back off of here and I'm gonna go uh, big, big screen because this is super important. What happens to the price point of the player's cards when they are the clear cut starter and, and focal point of defenses uh, from day one of their career? What does their price point do? Go straight up, right? But what happens when um, guys are fighting for playing time or not playing at all and totally are lost? Think Jordan Poole when he first started, didn't touch the field. Think Anthony Simons, did, uh, I said field because I was, I was also thinking about football players like Aaron Rodgers that don't touch the field. So, so this is like Peyton Manning versus Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers sat his ass on the bench and watched, right? Peyton Manning started day one and never looked back. So Peyton Manning's rookie cards when he first came out were probably way the hell up here off the screen. You can't even see it, right? But Aaron Rodgers was probably way down here. You can't even see it, right? And so that's a football example. Um, but but in basketball, you, you know who I'm talking about, the Jordan Pools, Pascal Siakam. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to think Giannis, for God's sakes, right? Uh, Giannis was just begging for playing time early in his career, right? Uh, so it, it's a double-edged sword. You're... Um, your price point kind of fluctuates uh, based on whether your guy's, you know, getting it done and in the game and performing right away or whether he's lost. And so this is just a sliding scale thing for you to consider. I'm not saying only buy dudes who you know are going to start. If you do, you, you minimize risk. It is more likely if your guy's starting day one, it's more likely he's not going to be a bust. Can it happen? Sure. Killian Hayes is an example. That guy's terrible. And he's played as a starter pretty much his whole career. Uh, there's a lot of guys like that that I just think are not very good players that have you know started and played from the beginning of their career. Okoro is another example. I don't think he's very good. I don't think he's a good basketball player. Michael Kidd Gilchrist started day one. I don't think he was a good basketball player, obviously. Um, so it, it minimizes risk for them to start day one, but it's not a sure thing. But if your guy is just buried, relax. I did a whole video on this. Go back, look in the playlist for NBA prospecting. Number one mistake NBA prospectors make is, well, my guy's not getting on the floor. My guy's, you know, doesn't get enough minutes. That's great. That just means you have a much bigger buying window. Do you know how many Anthony Simons cards I bought in like a three-year window because they were absolutely worthless because nobody gave a damn about him? He couldn't get on the floor. He had two, you know, one perennial all-star and one borderline all-star playing in front of him. It's just the way it is. Um, it just it just gives you more of an opportunity. Um, if they're not on the floor, it suppresses their price point. Does it increase the risk that they never get on the floor? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But when you're right, boy, you can crush it. Uh, Jordan Poole is a good freaking player, man. And and now you're seeing what Jordan Poole can do. Everybody knows what he can do. And I, I'll tell you right now, I own zero Jordan Poole cards. Actually, that's not true. I own four raw base prism Jordan Poole cards that I pulled out of packs. Okay, I own four Jordan Poole cards. I'm not here to hype Jordan Poole. I don't even own him. I'll hype Anthony Simons because he's my guy. Jordan Poole, I don't even own him. But the fact of the matter is, you could have cleaned house on Jordan Poole because he didn't see the floor hardly at all. Um, it, it, you know, again, he did play a little bit, but on a deep team like that, you just don't get on the floor that much. And so, same thing with Simons. He was in prison uh, for the longest time, and now he's exploding. Garland had to share with Sexton, right? And now he's exploded when he's got the ball by himself. So, keep in mind what that starting five horizon is. They've got to get there eventually. You will never make money if your guy doesn't get there, right? There's a long list of great six men. Uh, you know, like Tyler Hero is a good example. Like 
for people to really crush Tyler Hero and to get to the finish line and the max potential and for Tyler Hero to become an all-star and the player he needs to be, at some point the guy's got to freaking start. I get it, he's a six-man right now, but at some point the guy's got to start. Uh, and he's got, you know, obviously starter potential. I mean, he could start on a million teams in the league, so he's probably not a great example. But uh, but but when is your prospect going to get into that starting five? Um, so here's here's another one, and this is a uh, I did I did do a little bit of research, so I went back, okay, and I'm gonna kind of put this uh i want to kind of put this on the screen here let's see if this works hold on let me move this over move this over here okay and then let me go back and get you off here and let's get on picture on picture okay so here's my little spreadsheet right so i'm going to highlight this section here we're talking about their rookie uh season how old are they okay all right we're talking about how old are they when they first enter the nba this is a big factor to consider, okay? It's really close to moving this into the mandatory factors, right? But this is just a very important factor. I went all the way back to 2015, right? And so as you can see over here on this left column, I've got seniors uh, in college, guys who were drafted into the NBA first round who were seniors in college. Look at the list of names, okay? Kaminsky, Jerry Grant, DeLon Wright, Larry Nance Jr., Buddy Heald, Tayshawn, um, Torian Prince, Denzel Valentine, Karis LeVert, Bryce Johnson, Derek White, Josh Hart, Grayson Allen, Chandler Hutchinson, Tybal, Cam Johnson, Peyton Pritchard, uh, Azabuki, uh, Desmond Bain, Hobby Darling, uh, Chris Duarte. Ah, the jury's still out. He's a pretty good player. He might have a chance. And then Corey Kispert, okay? I have put into bold the names that are right now really hobby relevant, right? Guys who I've shown, they could be much better than average NBA players. Buddy Heald, Karis LeVert, Bain. Okay? Cam Johnson, average player. Matisse Tybel, not collectible. You know, Grayson Allen, he's a dude in the rotation who's dirty. Um, you know, you're looking at, you know, these are seniors that were drafted in the first round. You've got three out of however many you're looking at right there going back, what is that, seven years. Okay? That would lead me to believe if I made a list of first round picks who are freshmen, you'd have 20 franchise players in there, okay? Freshmen out of college drafted in the first round or guys who spent one year overseas like LaMelo and Giddy and all that drafted in the first round, you'd have 25, 30, 40, 50, 60, literally probably 60 players um, who are better than average NBA players who are in NBA starting lineups right now. When you look at seniors, I count three that are remotely hobby relevant right now. Comment below if you disagree with me. Let's take it a step further. I'm even gonna look at juniors, right? So these are not four-year college guys. These are three-year college guys. Look at the list. Willie Cauley-Stein, Sam Decker, Justin Anderson, RJ Hunter, Chris Dunn, DeAndre Bembry, Damian Jones, Justin Jackson, DJ Wilson. I haven't named a relevant player yet. Not even one relevant player in the hobby. Kyle Kuzma is showing a little spark. He's got a chance. Michael Bridges, great. He's 3 and D. He's a double. You could have made some money on Michael Bridges. Uh, how much better is Michael Bridges? Is Michael Bridges ever going to be the best or second best or third best player on his team? He's not right now. Uh, but I'll put him in, in all caps just in case. Uh, J uh, Jerome Robinson, Aaron Holiday, Mo Wagner, Jacob Evans. Shout out to Baton Rouge. Uh, Rui Hachimura. I put him in all caps because he's shown flashes of being relevant to where he could be one of the better players on his team. But he's not going to be better than Bradley Beal. Um, he's probably not better than Spencer Didwitty. I don't know if he ever will be or not. I don't know, but I put him in there because he is hobby relevant because uh, the, the, the jury is still out on him. Brandon Clark is just a jumping, running, rebounding guy. I mean, he's exciting and people went nuts for him his rookie year, but you can look. Brandon Clark fits perfectly into that high usage rate example. He can't dribble. He can't shoot. He's just not a guy who's got a really high ceiling. He's a guy who does exactly what you, you, know, what you think he's going to do. I just don't I don't find him very collectible. Uh, Grant Williams, Ty Jerome, Malachi Flynn, and then D Davion Mitchell. I know people are high on the guy, and I know he can guard, but he's a munchkin for his position. He's not a point guard. He's not really even a combo guard. He's kind of a two guard, and he's old. Uh, Trey Murphy, a catch and shoot, who has not shot <laughs> at all very well. And then Quentin Grimes has shown a few flashes. So I didn't put those guys in caps, you know, because they're just new, but Look at this list, guys. You know, that's six players that are even remotely hobby relevant. And I'm, and I'm, you know, giving the benefit of the doubt to Michael Bridges and Rui Hachimura because they're more NBA relevant than they are hobby relevant. Uh, but that's 42 total players 
drafted as a junior or senior in the past seven drafts, and none of them are home runs. Not one. 0 for 42. Nobody can disagree with that. None of these guys are franchise players. Nobody can even argue. I would even go so far as to say none of these guys are the second best player on their team. Maybe Kuzma. But Kuzma or Hachimura, one of them is going to be ruled out with the other, probably. I would say none of them are even the second best players on their teams. So that just leads me to believe if I'm looking for the next prospect, I'm looking at freshmen or international guys. I'm not looking at these guys. Um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe I'm crazy. Uh, but uh, but that's my take on that's my take on that. Um, so the last factor to consider is the team winning games. Your prospect's team at some point has to win games with him on the floor. Okay, this does matter. It matters less uh, day one, but it starts to matter more each successive year of your prospect's career. Okay, um, I, I, again, I don't want people to overreact and only look for prospects who play for contenders. That is 100% the opposite of what I do. That is. It's almost, it's almost what I try not to do, okay? Um, because I'm always looking for the best price point. Price point is key. Price point is everything. Um, so your your prospects team has to win games. It has to matter. Uh, it matters more as the prospects career goes along. It matters the least in his rookie year. I'm thinking Jalen Green, Cade Cunningham. You know, uh, I keep saying the same guys. Jalen Suggs. Uh, does it help that Mobley's on Cleveland and winning games? Yeah, it's gonna help. But it's not dispositive of, of his future potential value when it comes time to liquidate and to sell his cards. It doesn't matter that much his rookie year. It'll, it'll move the needle, but long-term, big picture, it's okay if they don't win right away because that'll suppress their price point. Imagine if the Pistons were doing what, uh, and not that you could buy his cards because Panini's sitting on their ass, but imagine if the Pistons were doing what the Cavs were doing right now. Right? Imagine if the Sacramento Kings were doing what the Cavs are doing or what the Memphis Grizzlies are doing with John Morant right now. Where would De'Aaron Fox cards be? Where would maybe even, you know, little Halliburton cards be? Right? It does matter. Um, what I'm saying is they've got to win games at some point. They don't have to win right away. Right? So the rookie year, what matters most is points, minutes, stat lines, highlights, hype. Um, dunking on people, scoring 20 points a game, that matters more than winning. It does. Because A, it lets you know, I got the right guy. Right? B, it suppresses their price point if they're not winning. Uh, and then C, um, you know, losing is great because that means they're probably going to get a, a good teammate the next year to improve the you know value of their team. I mean, look at what the Cavs are doing when Garland got Evan Mobley. Um it matters, right? So I hate to keep using the same example, but like Fox versus Garland, they're kind of doing the same thing. But, you know, if you look at the NBA standings, you know, the Cavs are two games out of first. For God's sakes, the Cavs are two games out of first. Who in the world would have ever thought that? And they're probably going to pass the Bulls because everybody's getting hurt. Um, I hope they don't pass the Bucks, but my God, the Cavs are one game behind the Bucks, the world champions, right? And they're two games behind the Nets, the super team of the century that, that everybody, you know, everybody's darling. Um, imagine if the Kings were two games out of first in the West. Imagine if the Kings, right, were in second place, two games. Imagine if the Kings were 34 and 9 in the West. Darren Fox's cards would be worth four times what they're worth right now. So winning does matter early in a prospect's career. It matters the least their rookie year, and then it starts to matter a little bit more. And, and Fox is a great example of this because everybody, you know, Fox's cards, you know, did go up in value pretty significantly, right? A after his rookie year, they're like, oh shit, this guy's really good, right? He's super fast with the ball. He's a blur. He's fantastic. He's like the next John Wall. That's great. And then the Kings have just been crap right for like two three years in a row and now you know the only thing that can really kind of save fox's cards i mean he can't he can't do more than 25 and 5 i mean you know the only thing that can make fox's cards go up is to get traded or to bring in somebody to, to play with them his team's got to succeed and so your your prospects cards are going to hit a ceiling if their team can't succeed with them being an integral part of it so um you know guys that i think about uh, who are really good prospects or potential, really good potential for prospects who play on shitty teams where it doesn't matter right now if they win, or Cade Cunningham, Cole Anthony, Jalen Green, Simons, Zion. Um, it, it doesn't matter yet that they win, but at some point they got to win and they got to be the guy. 
uh, to maximize that prospect potential. Um, anyway, guys, that's it. That's all I have for video number two for important um, factors to consider. So the, this is you know the second of a three-part video series. Uh, again, I just want to reiterate, I ain't saying there's only one way to do this. I just wanted to kind of generally discuss it. I'd love to get your comments. I know there's a million of y'all out there that, that NBA prospect. I'd love for you guys to take this video and uh, and share this video with your friends um, and say, hey, you know, see what this guy says, comment below. You know, I, I'd love to get more eyes on it and have more of a discussion. Prospecting is not dead. I don't care what anybody says. Prospecting is not dead if you know what you're doing and you know the right product and the right parallel. And when we get to video number three, you're going to see a whole lot of, um, uh, of what I call mandatory factors to consider. These are absolute must-haves, man, if you're going to pick a prospect. He's got to check the box in all of these categories, or, or if not all, most of them, uh, if you want to reduce risk and increase uh, potential return. And that's what it's all about when it comes to NBA prospecting. Buy low, sell high, and eliminating the likelihood that you get it wrong, right? That's all this is, is, uh, you know, it's like, I mean, really it's gambling on a player instead of gambling on a team. Um, so, uh, and it's fun. Hell, it's fun, man. I'm a collector, you know, 90% collector, 10% investor, but I can't shake this 10%. It's just too fun. And uh, I know everybody's saying get out of the ultra modern market and I just can't do it. I, I still put money into it because I still think there's money to be made and I'm doing it. Uh, and I know a lot of you guys who are watching this video are doing it or want to do it. Um, so, uh, again, I'm not out there selling advice for sure. <laughs> um, people even ask me, hey, take my money and invest invest it for me. And I'm like, that's not what I do, man. I, I don't want the pressure of spending somebody else's money. Um, I, I got my money and I just spend my money. And it's honestly, it's not about making zillions of dollars. It's just about being right and winning and saying, yeah, I got that one right. Yeah, it feels good. You know what I mean? Um, sometimes winning means more than money. You see it when NBA players uh, take less money to go win games. Bobby Portis, shout out Bobby Portis. Um, but anyway, that's it, guys, for video episode number two. Do me a favor, like and subscribe to the video. I'm sorry they're long. Uh, some of you guys may like that. Some of you guys may hate me by the time you get to the end of the video. Some of you guys may not even get to the end of the video. But if you got to the end of the video, I need you. I need you to take it. I need you to send it to three or four of your friends and uh, and just send them a link to the channel. Make it as easy as it is possible for them to subscribe and to like. Um, hit the like button if you like these uh, this three-part video series having to do with NBA prospecting. I'm releasing all three of these on the same day. I don't know if that's the right thing to do or not. Uh, but I'm going to. That way you can watch them bang, bang, bang if you've got, you know, two and a half hours to kill. Uh, but um, and then uh, do me a favor and comment below. Like I said, I want to know who you guys are investing in. I love talking about this stuff. Well, DM me on Instagram. On Instagram, I'm uh, Cajun Cardboard on Instagram. I'm Cajun Cardboard on Facebook. I'm Cajun Cardboard on YouTube. I'm easy to find, um, you know, and, uh, and you guys have sent me so many really fantastic comments. It really uh, keeps me going uh, because the growth is very slow because it's a very small niche. Uh, NBA basketball only and NBA basketball card collecting only. I am not talking about soccer, football, cricket you know, Pokemon, Marvel cards or anything like that, even though those things are really cool and fun and uh, there is some allure. I'm not talking about that. So it's hard to grow channels like this. You really got to find a bunch of like-minded people. So that's kind of my hope is that I find a bunch of people like me uh, who like what I like and like to listen to me talk about what we like together and just kind of grow this uh, grow this as a family. Make, make it a little less sterile and a little more uh, intimate, as creepy as that sounds. Uh, just people who like the same kind of thing and like to dig in. And, and uh, I mean, these are the text groups that I have with my collector friends. I'm just trying to create a much bigger group here so we can talk about it. And uh, the only way that happens is if you guys comment and, uh, and start a discussion on it. Anyway, thanks again for listening. I uh, appreciate all the loyal support support from everybody who subscribed. I think I'm at 147. Uh, my goal by the end of the year is 500. I don't know. It seems insurmountable um, and it is slow growth. But again, it's not all about the growth. This is therapeutic for me to get on here and talk and ramble. Um, but anyway, thank you guys for listening. Have fun. Stay positive in the hobby. Keep your head up. Uh, go find a new lane. Go find a new uh, path. Go collect a new player uh, or a new set. Uh, and peace. <laughs>